Well, we've entered into the month of June, and uh, we start a new series called Better Homes Than Gardens, and it really hasn't got a lot to do with your garden, but it has already gone, because the, the opening scripture that we're using is Isaiah 58, verse 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your need in a sun-scorched land and strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. I'm going to encourage you this morning to take notes, glory to God, because God's going to speak here this morning. God is relentlessly at work. He never stops working, maintaining our salvation. And in this church, it's not once saved, always saved. In this church, it's saved, walk the walk. Not a matter of talking the talk. It's a matter of being a Christian and doing what Christians do. True Christianity is receiving the most precious gift on planet Earth. There's nothing like salvation. Salvation to you is free, but it's not cheap. It came at a very, very expensive price to Jesus. True salvation means transformation. Desiring change, abstaining from sin, purposely walking with God, allowing and then responding to God's conviction. You know, God is forever convicting us. And sometimes we brush off that feeling. But I want to tell you something. The more, you, the more sensitive you become to the Holy Spirit, the more you'll find that he'll convict you of the smallest and tiniest things. And the things that weren't sin last year have now become sin. Because the closer you draw to God, the holier your walk becomes. Leading a lifestyle of holiness and genuine repentance, unrepentant sin will separate you from God. That's the barrier that Satan wants to put between us. That's separation. Jesus Christ feared nothing, no, no man, but he did fear separation from God. And when the righteous Christ took on the sins of the world, and Jesus became sin, the Father could no longer look upon him. And that's why he cried out from the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? And see, Jesus Christ had built a relationship between a man, a human being, and God. And he didn't know and he didn't understand separation, but he knew that he had to take on your sin and my sin and become sin. And that's when the father could no longer look at his son. And for the very first time, Jesus Christ was separated from his father. So sin, glory to God, is that that will separate us from God. God is holy, sin isn't. If we're truly wanting to spend eternity with God, then we must desire what he desires. And he says, be holy as I am holy. God is a holy God. Heaven is a holy place. He's given us a holy word. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. And Deuteronomy tells us how to become holy. Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 13 says, Israel, you can put your name in there. What does the Lord God require from you but that you fear the Lord God, that you walk in all of his ways, that you love him, that you serve him with all of your heart, with all of your soul? Verse 13 is incredibly interesting. It says, keep the commandments and statutes of God. And, you know, we often hear people preach on the commandments, keeping the word, and that's all good and true. But this, the word statutes, when you look it up, actually means immunity granted. And how many times God has granted immunity to us? How many times has he released us from our sin, from our bondage? Glory to God. My first point is this that obedience is far better than sacrifice. There is a door that stands between light and darkness. It's undetected by many. Isaiah 5, 13 says, For my people have gone into captivity. There's people who have walked right into bondage and sit there right now. Because they have no knowledge or no, vis no vision, their honorable men are famished. The multitudes are drying up with thirst. So we're talking about a people who are in a dying state because they lack vision, because they lack revelation, because they lack the knowledge that Jesus Christ is right now but into them. And the world is filled with these people who are in a dying state right now. Godly ignorance 
comes at a very high price. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people perish because of lack of vision, knowledge, understanding. Proverbs for vision in God. And this is part of what's going to be imparted tonight. You know, God has got a vision for every single person. Every single person that sits in this building, God has a vision, a plan, a purpose for your life. He wants us to uproot all that hinders that vision from coming to pass because it says, blessed is the man who keeps the law. We need to understand that the enemy is real and Satan is the master of deception and deceives many. Have a listen to what God says about Satan. Revelation 12, 9. The great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, the hater of mankind, called the devil. Satan, who deceives the whole world. Did you get that? Satan, who deceives the whole world. The whole world is under a deception, glory to God, and the only way you can come out from under that deception is through relationship with Jesus Christ. And there are people out there believing this and believing that and not knowing that soon they'll give an account to God. Now, get this. We're talking about vision. We're talking about having a pathway set before you. Here is Satan's vision. Satan who deceives the whole earth. What's our vision? Go into all the world and preach the good news unto every creature. That's our vision. That, that's not just for the evangelists. That's just not for the fivefold ministry, the pastors. That's for every believer, a priest, every person sharing the good news, every person telling someone about Jesus. Because here's Satan's vision, clear as crystal, Satan who deceives the whole world. Well, we've got to, we've got to pull people out of that deception. Satan tries to subtly undermine God's holy word. Mark. 4.15, it says, as soon as they hear the word, Satan comes to steal that word. So you're hearing a word now, let it sink deep. Jesus said, let it sink deep into your ears, deep into your heart, restore it. Just keep it, store it up in your heart and don't let it be stolen from you. It must be settled in, in our hearts that God's word is his final authority. When Jesus taught, Luke 4.32, they were astonished at his teaching. For his word was one with authority. It's an amazing thing when we actually believe what God tells us to do because you have every single person in this room has all power and all authority over all things in heaven and earth. It says here that we need to cry out to God for daily discernment. Psalm 88 verse 13, I have cried out unto the Lord in my morning prayers for they come before you as incense. First Chronicles says, and they cried out to the Lord of battle. He, heed the, he heeded their prayer because they put their trust in him. I want to look at that today. What causes God to respond to our prayers? What, causes, what attracts the ear of God? That God would listen to me, a man. It says here in Proverbs 3, verses 5, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct you your path, you need to understand something that his path in your life is unfailing. It's unfailing. It's the best path you could ever walk. And Satan does everything he can to take us off that path. Is it all right to preach like this this morning, to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Glory to God. Is it okay to preach about sin? Is it okay to speak about the devil? Is it okay to, to preach the gospel to you? Proverbs 1.7 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and knowledge. The wisdom and knowledge that we're speaking about comes from above. Godly fear leads to wisdom and breeds righteousness. Romans 5.19 says, for by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So Adam sinned in the garden. He opened the door to sin and sin entered the hearts and the lives of many men. And the Word of God goes on to say, but by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. But Jesus Christ laid down his life, willingly gave his life, put it on a cross, allowed his innocent blood to be shed. And the Word of God says, by the disobedience of one, many were made sinners. By the obedience of another, many were made righteous. 
How amazing is that? How clear is that, that righteousness comes from obedience? Disobedience breeds sin. Not getting one amen this morning. That's all right, I just preached to myself. The Word of God says, James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We're told to cleanse our hands, purify our hearts. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he cried out to God and said, God, I need some help here. Do you know it actually says that the angels came and ministered to him? Matthew 4.11 says, And the angels of God came and ministered to Jesus. See, a righteous heart, a righteous prayer, shuts the door to the devil. The devil can't penetrate holiness. He can't penetrate righteousness. He can only operate with disobedience and sin. Disobedience is actually giving Satan legal access what, what, what does disobedience look like? It's Ephesians 4.26 is just one of many examples. When you're angry, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So God's encouraging us to keep short accounts and live a righteous life and not allow disobedience to come. The Word of God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin lies obedience, always costs dearly. I'm going to give you an example about what I'm talking about with King Saul, 1 Samuel 15, 15, 3. So my first point was obedience is far better than sacrifice. For the Word of God says, 1 Samuel 15, 3, Now go and attack Amalek, utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare any of them. Kill all of the people and all of their animals. So very specific instruction. God said, I've given you the victory in this battle, Saul. But you need to get rid of the enemy. You need to get rid of the enemy. And this is what happens when, because in verse 8 it says, Saul, Saul attacked the Amalekites. He obeyed God. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, disobeyed. Utterly destroyed all the people with the sword. Obeyed. Saul compromises and refuses to go through with God's instruction because in verse 9 it says, Saul and all the people spared Agag. Now this is where it starts. They spared the king. They spared the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. They were unwilling to destroy. When God says, get rid of it, get rid of it. Like there are certain things that God... Stop the swearing. Stop the fighting. Stop the drinking. Stop the smoking. There were many things that God said, stop it. Stop it. But they were unwilling. What did God goes on to say in verse 10? Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, wow, I'd hate, I'd hate to hear God say this to me. I greatly regret that I've set up Saul as king for he has turned back from following me. And not obeyed my commandments. And it grieves Samuel the prophet. And Samuel goes, Blessed are you of the Lord, for I've, com- I've, I've performed the commandment of the Lord. Saul was walking in total deception. He believes he's done right. He's, he, he went to war and he put everything to the sword, but he spared this and he spared that and he spared this and he spared that. And when God's want, wanting to get rid of it, And Samuel the prophet said, what then is that bleeding of sheep in my ears? He said, what is that that I hear? You destroyed everything. Really? Listen to the excuse. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord God. Guess what? God doesn't want that sacrifice. Good intentions. Good intentions. I love this. Verse 16, and Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. In other words, shut up, king, and listen to what God is saying. 
I will tell you what the Lord is saying. The head of the tribes of Israel. Did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? So God had not only anointed Saul, but get this, he had put his trust in Saul. He said, Saul, I want you to lead my people, not astray, to where I want to take them, to where I want them to be. And the question is asked in verse 19, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord your God? Verse 20, look at the deception now. Compromised obedience, this is where it leads to. But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have. And I brought back King Agag. Guess what God said, don't bring him back. And I've utterly destroyed the enemy. It was a part truth. Verse 21, but the people took the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, and the best things that should have been utterly destroyed. Get this, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. He's insulting the prophet now, saying, we we did this to, to sacrifice to your God, Samuel. Now, Saul should have said, my God, but he identified that the God that he was serving was not the God that the prophet was serving. Check this out in verse 22. So Samuel said, To Saul, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, behold, switch your ears on, hear this. To obey is better than sacrifice. First point there, glory to God, that obedience is far better than sacrifice. Rebellion. God got rid of it. He threw all repast down upon the earth. Do you think that God is going to allow rebellion to go back into heaven? I guarantee you it won't. Because 1 Samuel 15, 23 says, For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity leading unto idolatry. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, so he has rejected you. Wow. Talk about getting a slap in the face. I want to share something with you that is so real to me right now. But at the beginning of the year, God spoke to me. He said, I want you to get closer to the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, I've got a good relationship with the Holy Spirit. He said, I didn't say that. I want you to get closer to the Holy Spirit. So I embarked upon a journey. I said, Lord, what are you saying to me? He said, I want you to know the person, the person of the Holy Spirit. He said, you know healings, you've seen his deliverances, you know the presence of God, you know the anointing, but now I want you to know him, the Holy Spirit. And I thought, wow, okay, Lord. A couple of months went by and I've been directing all my attention to the Holy Spirit and I shared this with someone, they said, that, that, that's, you, you've got to put your attention on Jesus, listen to me. The more attention I put on the Holy Spirit, the more focus he put onto Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will never take any glory to himself at all. He'll always point you to Jesus. I was minding my own business one day in worship. And God said, I want you to look up the word in Hebrew, Holy Spirit. Ruach HaKadosh. It means presence of God, anointing of God, wind of God, breath of God. And every single time I said that word, the anointing just runs straight through my mortal body. Ruach HaKadosh. It's like you invite the Holy Spirit to breathe upon you. And now this has been happening for most of this year, but only the last couple of weeks. See, I'm here standing in front of this congregation preaching but I'm not. Right now, I'm standing on the highest mountain on planet Earth. It's snow-capped, but it's not cold. I'm looking down upon everything that's happening. The war in Israel, what they're doing to Trump and all sorts of things, it's all down there. But I'm up there with him. 
and I'm looking down upon the carnage of humanity. Doesn't mean I'm not involved in it. Doesn't mean I'm not praying about it. God will elevate you to a place where Satan can't touch you. In the last couple of weeks, I've had different ones. Intercessors say, God's surrounding you with his glory. I thought I was standing on the highest mountain on planet earth. The higher it gets. He elevates you above Psalm 27 says, and now my head shall be lifted up above all my enemies that surround me. Guess what? The enemies are all there, down there. They're no longer in my face, no longer sitting on my shoulder whispering in my ear, but they're all down there. It's an amazing thing, glory to God, when you press into God. Like this trip that we're doing. God spoke to me, he said, I want you to go and visit with Pastor Clark Taylor. He's my mentor, one of. I respect the man because of what he did. Yes, he fell, but he also repented. David fell and repented and became a man after God's own heart. Pastor Clark has ministered to me so many times in so many different ways. I visited him last year. I'm trying to visit him at least once a year because I know that he won't be here much longer. This might be my final visit. And as soon as I obeyed God, the phone starts ringing. Can can you come and preach for us? We want you in our Bible college. Hey, hey, what what, what, what date you come down? Man, we, we come and preach in our church. And I've got different people. I'm, I'm not even trying to make things happen. See, when, as soon as you obey God, I didn't say, well, hang on, I'll, I'll, go and, I'll go and line up my ministry appointments and if I've got time, I'll go and see. Pastor, Pastor Clark, I want you to see him. Yes, sir. Rang up Clark, said, we're coming down. Book the tickets. When you obey God, God will open doors and he elevates you. He tells us in Proverbs 3, 7, don't be wise in your own eyes. He tells us in Proverbs 4, 20, listen closely to my words. Keep them within your heart. Psalm 91, verse 15 says, he shall call upon me. Look at this. And I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. God says, In those short few few verses, five times, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, when you obey. Obedience is an amazing thing because he said, if you love me, obey me. When we disobey God or we operate in unbrokenness, which is my second point, we actually give access to Satan. Satan. Disobedience opens the door to something you don't want to open the door to. How do I know? I have disobeyed God previously. Try not to do it anymore. Ask God to give me strength. I said, Lord, what are we doing today? He said, I want you to open the altar when you finish preaching. And he said, I'm going to pour out strength to obey. And every time God tells me to do something, I said, but God... He said, don't, don't but, goats but, sheep don't. Every time God asked me to do something, like he asked me one time, build this building, I thought, wow, really? As soon as we put a bit of this, started digging the holes, the finances started pouring in. The provision started coming. And I want to tell you something quite clearly. This building will not contain what God is about to do on planet Earth. God views where it is that we worship. Saul was called of God, born, anointed to be king. Even his statue was above everyone. He was perfect for the job. But guess what? He was totally disqualified. The anointing removed off him, given to another. He was unqualified, but willing. 
And it's an amazing thing when we say, God, no longer I who live, but now Christ living in me. Are we willing to lay down our lives before God as Christ laid down his life for us? 2 Thessalonians 2.7 says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. There are lawless spirits out there that operate. And you know, after 12 years of prison ministry, there's something that I learned in that ministry that just opened my eyes. I ministered to men who had murdered people. And they would testify and said, but, but, but this voice, this voice told me to do it. I said, yeah, but the voice ain't doing time. You are. Because you listen to the wrong voice. And God is speaking to us this morning. Anybody getting anything out of this? Mighty quiet out there this morning. Listen to what God says. This is what God is trying to do. Sin, which leads to death. Romans 16, 16. Obedience, which leads to righteousness. Disobedience leads to death. Obedience leads to righteousness. Doesn't get any clearer than that. Godly obedience breeds strength. It actually strengthens you when you obey God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Who believes that they're smarter than God? He's all-knowing wisdom, knowledge. He's got, man, he is so perfect. And I am so imperfect. But I'm being perfected by God through his wisdom because his ways are unfailing. His ways are unfailing. He's got unfailing wisdom. Point three, the absolute blessing that comes from godly obedience. John 14, 23 says, Jesus said, if any man loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. Get this, and we will come to him and make our home with him. God's invitation is that the triune nature of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, want to come and live with you in your life, in your house, in your family. Guess what? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you are most welcome to come and live in our place. Please come and live in our house. Why? Because I've lived with darkness previously. How do we achieve godly obedience? This is how you achieve it. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will bring to remembrance all things. And as believers, we need to do nothing else except love God. It ain't hard. He said, if you love me, obey me. You know, I used to drink a fair bit. When I got saved, three weeks after I got saved, at night I'd drink my rum. During the day we'd be breaking horses, breaking bulls, picking up hay, doing all sorts of physical work. I'd come home and just grab my six-pack of beer every day. And three weeks after I got saved, God said, son, when are you going to stop? I said, God, my whole life, it's part of who I am. But you know what? If you help me, I'll stop right now. And he said, you listen to me and you obey me. I said, all right. Go to the fridge. You opened my fridge back then. It was just amber in color. Vicky couldn't find anywhere to put her fruit and veg. It was full of beer. I went to the fridge, opened it up, Grabbed all the beer, put it down the sink. He said, now the medicine cabinet. See how clear it is in my, in my head? I can see it right now. Open the medicine cabinet. Bottle of Captain Morgan. Down the sink. Bundy rum. Ouzo. This, that. Until I finally got to an uncracked bottle of Bundy rum down the back. And I said, I'll leave that for Vicky's cooking. He said, don't be a fool, son. Put it down the sink. Do you know back then I was quite a fit man? 
And I got that bottle and I could not crack it. My hands were shaking. Could not crack the lid. I've cracked that many lids of rum bottles. It's not funny. Could not crack that one. My hands were shaking. I cried out to God and said, God, if you want me to do this, you've got to strengthen me. I saw it me, cracked the lid, put it down. As that fluid went out of that bottle, I saw it run out of the bottle into the sink. As that thing ran out of the bottle, this thing come out of me. A spirit of addiction left me. I didn't go to rehab. I didn't have counseling. I didn't have the pastor lay hands upon me and pray for me. Not that there's anything wrong with any of that stuff. It was me and God over the sink. And obedience versus... And he strengthened me. And that's what he wants to do today. That's what he wants to do today. He will strengthen you to obey him. I might add that was 33 years ago and I have not touched one drop of alcohol since. So anyone want to shout amen here or what? Am I boring you? Is this boring? It's real. It happened. It should encourage you. But the help of the Holy Spirit, cry out to the Holy Spirit. John 15 verse 1 says, I am the true vine, my Father is the vine dresser, and every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Get this, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Ouch. The pruning process of God is not an easy one. And I keep asking God not to use the chainsaw and use the secretaries when he prunes me. Because the chainsaw hurts. The secretaries are a bit more gracious. But I've also come to learn one thing. That if I obey him, there's no need for a chainsaw. And there's no need for secretaries. There's just obedience. He's trying to show you something here today. John 15, 8 says, By my Father, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, that you be my disciples. You know, when you talk to that neighbor across the fence, let them see Jesus. When, you, when, you, when you're at your workplace and your workmates, let them see Jesus. Glory to God. Be his disciples. Let everyone see Jesus Christ in you. John 15, 11, it's already been spoken here today. These things I speak to you that your joy may remain in you. It's an amazing thing when God causes you to smile and nothing can wipe that smile from your face because you're no longer, dis- but you are now on the mountaintop with God. And I'm telling you now, this is not for selected people. This is for every single believer. Every single one of you can live on the mountaintop above all the enemies that surround you. You can do this in God. You'll never achieve it by yourself. Listen to what he says. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. When a man chooses to obey God, you now start living life to the max. Things start happening. Things start happening that just amazing things happen around about your life. Incredible things happen when you choose to obey God. The direct blessing that comes. John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no man than to lay his life down for his friends. You know, I could quite easily say, mm, Pastor Clark Taylor, he's, he's quite an old man now. He's not pastoring anymore. He's in aged care. I don't need to go there no more. The last time I saw Pastor Clark Taylor, I took Apostle Brent Douglas there and introduced him to Pastor Clark. And as Pastor Clark prayed, I share this before God, his whole face changed as the anointing just swept through him. And I watched an old, aged, infirm man become so powerful in prayer. His whole face changed. He looked 20 years younger in 10 minutes. God showed me what the anointing can do will do to you. 
It is the wellspring of life. When you're still being attacked by the enemy, but the enemy can't touch you. John 15, 16. Wow. Whatever you ask in my Father's name, he will give you. John 14, 1. Let your heart not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. John 14, 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to believe that every person in this building is going to go to heaven. It's not my choice. It's your choice. I'm going to heaven. That's it. I refuse to go anywhere else. But when I get to heaven, am I going to just go to heaven and that's it? No, we're going to go before the beam and see judgment. And you're going to get blessed in heaven with much more than a mansion. You're going to get blessed for every time you prayed. You're going to get blessed for every time you opened the Bible. You're going to get blessed for every time you went to church. You're going to get blessed for every time you shared the word. You're going to get blessed for every time you went and helped someone in need. You're going to get blessed for every time you did any sort of godly deed. And we don't do it for the blessing. We do it to obey God. I don't pastor this church for no other reason except to obey God. And God's speaking to us to lift the bar on our Christianity. Because in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. I'm just going to throw this one out there. But Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth in six days. And some people say, oh, but you know, six days. It says he created the heavens and the earth in six days. He's been up there for 2,000 years building mansions. Wow. Wow. This is something you don't want to miss out on. This is something you don't want to neglect. He says in Romans 14, 2, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3, maybe also, that's an open invitation to spend eternity with God. And when you get there, he says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the things that I have stored up for you. He wants to heap blessing upon blessing upon blessing because you are now a king's kid. You're not just some old Christian attending church. You're a king's kid. You're a son of thunder. You're a daughter of destiny. Believe it and receive it. And it's not Ripley's believe it or not. This is Jesus Christ. Believe it and receive it. John 14, 4 says, And where I go, you know. And the way you know. The Bible is our code of conduct, our survival manual. It's your roadmap to heaven. We all have a roadmap that tells us where we're going. I close with this, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to me except through the Father. I believe today God wants to strengthen whoever wants to be strengthened to obey God.